If it's the middle of November in Northern Europe and light out when you wake up, you can be pretty sure that you overslept. At first, I just opened one eye to assess the exact level of morning after pain in my body. It was okay after all. I walked into the bathroom and in the shower I got stuck in what was left of the night, like I so often do. I had dreamt that I had walked onto a stage twice, claiming a gold medal. Nice, speaking of dreams. To my surprise, walking back to my bedroom, I noticed two golden trophies on the table, and I realized that a bottle of champagne can make dreams and memories pretty similar. I had actually picked up two golds. The ad agency I was managing had had a particularly good year at the European award show Eurobest, and I had been particularly involved. About a year later, I was standing in front of a pharmacy window, looking at the shelves and white coats inside. In my hand was the final proof that I was going insane. I called my boyfriend sobbing. I can't do it, I whined. They're going to laugh at me. This is so fucking embarrassing. I'm going to die. I'm going to lay right down here at the sidewalk and I'm going to die. He explained to me that they had probably given someone antidepressants before. And somehow that sounded quite reasonable. So I stepped inside, mascara running down my face, to pick up my first ever prescription of sertraline. The package said, twice daily for symptoms of burnout. This is not how I normally introduce myself when I speak. Uh, normally I would say that I am an advertising researcher and a teacher at Stockholm School of Economics. I have my background in the ad industry where I worked as a creative in agencies in Stockholm and in New York. I'm also a writer and a columnist, and up until about a year ago, I was running one of Sweden's most influential feminist political blogs. So that's me. And I think I said something like that a couple of years ago when I was lecturing. And after the lecture, which I think went pretty okay, this woman came up to me, and she like pulled me to the side a little bit. And she was like, Nina, I'm sorry, but I have to ask you, how old are you? And I was... I heard on, by the tone of her voice that she hoped that I would say 47 or maybe 73. Uh, but it turned out that I was 28 and that was her age as well. And that's what she was fearing. Because she told me that she had sat there my entire lecture only feeling miserable because she felt like I had accomplished so much more than she had. And that was not a nice feeling. And that left me feeling pretty shitty as well because I realized that every time I stand on the stage talking about what I talk about and introduce myself that way, I contribute to something that I really don't like. Namely, the fact that most of us have a tendency to talk a lot about the things we have done that went well, according to plants. But the other things, the ones that did not go so well, we tend to sort of forget about a little bit. So I decided to nuance this image a little bit, to sort of remedy my mistake. And I went home and I wrote a blog post. Uh, about my burnout, uh, similar to the things that I just read to you in the introduction. And the next morning, as any self-absorbed blogger would do, I went in to check the stats. And it turned out that within a few hours, this post had been shared hundreds of times. And in the next few hours, it was thousands of times. And by the end of the day, it had become the most read and spread text that I had ever written. So that was pretty interesting. And, and also emails started coming in. And they were all from people who could somehow relate to my story about burning out. Other than that, they were pretty different. Men and women, different ages, different industries, different positions in those industries. But what they all had in common was one thing. They had what you would call dream jobs. You know, they were creative people in fascinating companies and interesting industries, usually leaders, even celebrities. And they could all relate to my story. And I thought, well, hey, that's weird, because I'd read a lot about burnouts. I knew that people who burn out are people who hate their jobs. They have horrible bosses, they have no control over their work environment, and it's altogether pretty dreadful. And I couldn't relate to that, and those people couldn't relate to that either. So being an academic, as I am, I had just to take a step back and ask myself the most important academic question of them all, namely, what the fuck is going on? 
And that's something that I've spent the last few years doing, thinking about this. And I have a few theories on why this is happening, why so many people with dream jobs tend to be burning out. And I want to share some of them with you here today. The first theory I simply call blame it on the media, because you can always do that, right? Um, the thing is that I started reading in the late 80s. I was born in 1984. So by the time I could get through, you know, a daily newspaper and the business and econo um, economy session, section in a newspaper, it was the early 90s. So whenever I flipped through the newspaper on my family's breakfast table, it looked like this. And then a few years went by and it started looking like this. And, but that was just for a short while because then it was like this again. And then a little bit of that and then back to that. My entire life has been an economic crisis. I have always read that there are no jobs. If there are jobs, they're probably going away soon anyway. And even if they're for some reason are still around, they're not for you because you're young and we all know that young people cannot get a job in this economy, right? So if you by any chance randomly happen to have a job and also a job that you actually like, then you better be pretty damn sure not to fuck up for one little bit because there will be thousands and thousands of people ready to replace you if you make a tiny mistake. So that was sort of the idea that I had going into my first job. And then I realized a few years in that this was not entirely true. Sure, we do have high unemployment rates, too high. And, but still, most people do have jobs. Over 90% in Sweden have jobs. And most people actually have jobs that they like. But even though I knew that for a fact, after a while, it was still really hard to shake that feeling that everything I had, the job that I really loved, was temporary and that it could be taken away from me at any time if I didn't try hard enough. And I think that's something that's common for many people, I guess, in this room who probably have those sort of dream jobs that you feel like it's, you're a little bit of a fake and it's probably all going to go away soon. So I think that's one of the reasons that we end up in this situation. The other theory that I want to share with you is something I call Navid's question. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a party and I ran into this guy, uh, Navid Modiri. Do you know of him? Uh, for those of you who don't, he's, in my opinion, one of Sweden's most interesting political activists, really funny, entertaining guy. Uh, I didn't know him personally at the time, so we started chatting and he introduced himself and he was like, so who are you? And I answered the way I did in the introduction saying that, well, I'm a writer, I am a researcher, I'm a teacher. And he was like, no, 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 I didn't ask you what you do. I asked you who you are. And I was like, what a douche. Like, who is this person walking up to me, asking me about who I am in a party? No, no, that's not, I'm not going to answer that question. But, but then I realized, thinking about it a little bit more, that Navid wasn't a douche. He was a person asking me an honest question. The problem was that I had no answer whatsoever to that question. And that made me feel pretty horrible. Uh, so, actually, after this conversation, I kind of got stuck in some sort of existential crisis almost, because I realized that that has to be bad, right? The fact that I define myself by what I do, that's a problem. It doesn't sound right. So, okay, I need to fix this. So, I probably need to get a hobby. Maybe I should do Zumba, or I should take a pottery class, or, or go bird watching. Something that's just not work, that could define me. But then I thought about it some more, and I realized that I really don't like Zumba. I, I've tried it a few times, it's, it's not for me. Pottery, I don't know, I don't think I'm relaxed enough to do that. And, and bird watching, uh, definitely not for me. Uh, and I realized that I tend to take what I really enjoy doing, what would be a hobby, and turn it into work. So that's why I'm a writer, and that's why I'm uh, sort of engaged in gender equality issues, etc. So I've sort of switched that around. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that maybe that isn't so bad after all. Because to be honest, a lot of people that I truly admire have that sort of boundary-less personality, where it seems like they invest a lot of themselves in what they do for a living, and their work and their personalities are very much intertwined. And I think that's one of the things you need in order to be able to go that far, to really invent new things. So to be honest, I think that 
we, the world needs more people like this and maybe less people who do pottery, probably. Um, but, and here's the key, what the world doesn't need are more people who burn out. So rather than trying to come up with like a thing that's separate from work that I can do to relax, I needed something else. And I realized that what I needed was to find strategies to be what you do without falling apart completely. And that's something that I've been trying to achieve ever since, like in the last few years, coming back from my burnout and trying to carve out a new way to work that is probably a little bit more sustainable. And I think this is particularly important to those of you who feel like you actually have a dream job. You do exactly what you want and you find it meaningful and you find it fun and you find it in every way rewarding. This is for you specifically. So I've tried many strategies over the last few years. Some of them have worked well, some of them have not worked so well, uh, but I'm, I wanna share three of the most successful ones with you. So bear with me. The first one is that I think we need to think energy rather than time. We live in a society that is completely obsessed with time. We talk about full-time, part-time, half-time, we have overtime, we have eight-hour workdays, we have 40-hour work weeks, we have five weeks of vacation, we have X amounts of parental leave. It's always defined by the time it takes to do something. However, that is not based on the reality of work life today. It's based on like an industrial economy, industrial revolution type economy where people were mostly working in factories or farming and where actually another hour of work would lead to another hour of output. Then it makes sense to count it that way. But for us today, it doesn't look like that for most of us. We have work days that are completely different from day to day. It may be that one day, like today, you're all sitting here, you're enjoying yourselves. After this, you might go to the after conference party and you might go out for dinner with colleagues and you have worked for 15 hours without even knowing it. It was probably giving you energy rather than taking it. However, another time it might be that you have a presentation that you have to give in front of 300 people. And that can be a little bit draining. So maybe that day you need to stop working after one hour and feel the exact same level of energy invested that you did another day where you actually worked 15 hours. So I think it's very important that we stop focusing so much about how long it takes to do something and more about how we feel after doing it. So that's one thing that I think we need to keep in mind. The second strategy is a little bit depressing. It is that we all have to remember that nobody gives a shit. And I know this is news because most of us feel like we're in the center of the universe at all times and everyone's revolving around us. But to be honest, that, that is not the case. Uh, most people in the world have no idea who you are. I'm sorry. They don't even know that you exist. And then we have the few people who are closer to you who actually know that you exist. However, they don't spend that much time thinking about you either. They see you flashing by on Facebook or you bump into them on the streets, but other than that, they don't even know you're around. The few, few people who actually know about you, who think about you, they are also usually the ones who care about you. So that would be your family and your friends and your coworkers. And the good thing about this is that those people are usually interested in you being happy. So they're not out there to gloat at your mistakes, at least if you pick them well. Uh, if, you have, if you don't feel like they do that, you should probably consider changing some of them. Um, they're not out there to judge you. They're there to support you. And that means that you can fuck up pretty miserably and still be okay because no one will even notice. And even if you do over and over again, they will soon forget about it. So I think that's one way to sort of distance yourself a little bit from when you feel like everything's overwhelming uh, and you don't really know what to do with yourself. Finally, my third strategy is to have a sincere conversation with your inner 85-year-old. The thing is that when we're busy or stressed, we tend to focus very much on what's exactly in front of us. We tend to forget and sort of mix up what is urgent with what is actually important. And this exercise is sort of a way to go around that. So the way you do it is that you grab a piece of pen and a paper and you start describing yourself at 85. Where do you live? What do you wear? Who are you with? What do you look like? And most importantly, what kind of life do you look back on? 
And it's actually pretty fascinating how just that exercise can help you prioritize and sort of start distinguishing between these urgent things that may not be so important and the things that actually are. For example, most 85-year-olds think it's way more important to be healthy than to have a successful career. Most of us sitting here don't agree with that at this moment, but we do if we actually think about it in the long run. For example, if you want to be an 85-year-old who has traveled a lot, then you need to start traveling. So this exercise can actually help you a lot because I think that making yourself a happy 85-year-old is actually the point of it all. Thank you.